Sitting on top of my mama's bedroom dresser It belonged to her mother Yeah, we sure do miss her And Uncle Larry's got A big orange tractor sitting in the drive he tills and plows us to try to survive. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, we've all got these tokens and treasures. They're the art sticks of life we can measure. But honey, if I had to pick between your love and and all of these things I'd pick you Ooh, ooh, ooh I'd pick you Thank you High five, girl That was awesome, thank you Laura's amazing And she is just everywhere these days, so All right, Creative Mornings. We are 148 chapters strong around the world, which is just amazing, this glow, growing global community right now. And we love to share and connect with our fellow chapters around the world. We've connected with Taipei, we've connected with, who else have we connected with? Um, we also that, so Jerusalem, we, last month you guys recorded a message to, to Jerusalem. And we'll record another one today, but they, of course, returned the favor by recording us a message. So we're gonna play it right now. This is Creative Mornings, Jerusalem. Shalom, y'all of Charlotte. Happy Creative Mornings. I think that's, they said Shalom, y'all Charlotte, which I think is sort of, it's not exactly right, but it is, I love it though. It's, appreciate the effort. So, okay, do I need this anymore or are we good with this? I can take, okay. So, walked right through the door there. So we're going to record one for Rome this morning. OK, here we go. You ready? When I point at you. At 24 years old, Harrison Chicas is a renowned spoken word artist invited around the world to share his storytelling gift and his inspirational poetry to entertain, empower, and enlighten audiences. His work has been featured on major platforms such as National Public Radio, PRI, and on the TED stages, reaching more than 1.5 million people worldwide. Now, as a slam poet, he's the current champion of the TEDx UNC Spoken Word Slam, a finalist in Slam Charlotte and Bull City Slam, and a semifinalist to Youth Speaks Brave New Voices Poetry Slam, the world's biggest youth poetry competition. Here to talk to us about the theme of love, please welcome Harrison Chicas. Hi. My, 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 my name, my name is Chicas, and they say your eyes are the windows to your soul, and uh, I see me in you. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, you're so beautiful that you blow my head. I mean, blow my mind, blow my mind. Ah. What I'm trying to say is that I want to take you out. Nah. I want to do more than take you out. I want to build a bank in your chest so your heart will never be broke. I want to tattoo your name to the inner walls of my lungs so I never forget the reason I'm breathing. I want to wake up to the sunshine in your smile and go to sleep counting the stars in your eyes. She don't want us to be the reason Cupid takes out a retirement plan because he can't handle a love like ours. I want, I want, you know what I want? I want something dramatic to happen. Something like I walk into the street, get run over by a car, go into a coma what happened at me is you just to wake up and fall in love with you all over. I want to text God and tell him he accidentally dropped the dime on earth and I just happened to pick it up. See, I want to tell you you're beautiful more times than any mirror will ever do. And I want to know, yeah, I want to know when love decided to put caterpillars into my food because now I have butterflies in my stomach. <laughs> I want to be a superhero. 
I want to be a superhero, but nothing like your ex me. I, want, I want it to be you and me and the goosebumps on your legs. I want my lips to help you lip sing until we fall asleep singing love songs. I want my tongue to kiss every cell in your body because we Latinos are good at rolling our R's for a reason. <laughs> Hi, let me start over. Hi, my name is Harrison Chicas, and everybody calls me Chicas, so you can call me Chicas too. And there's a deli that they just opened down the block, and I was wondering if hopefully, possibly, maybe I could take you out. Whew. Okay, Mirror, now I gotta go ask her. <laughs> Charlotte, good morning. How's everybody doing today? I'm super excited to be here. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, the whole Charlotte Creative Mornings team for inviting me. Now, as Matt said, my name is Harrison Chicas, and depending on who you are, I'm either an executive coach, an organizational management consultant, a spoken word artist, or the next Mario Lopez. I've been given many titles for what I do, but essentially what I do is I enhance performance and the quality of life of people and businesses, and I hope to do that here today. Now, I've had the, bless, uh, the blessing opportunity to travel the country and perform at prominent universities, as well as major platforms here in the United States. And in doing that, I've come to understand a little bit about why and how people feel. And as we all know, today we're going to be speaking about love. Now, the very first thing that we need to do when we speak about love is first break down our perception that we have of love. Because of movies, fairy tales, stories, all these different things, we've come to be conditioned as to how we see love, how we perceive it. So when I say love, many of us think of the knight in shining armor, or the girl in the red dress, or the Latino poet who can roll his R's. <laughs> but, and I'm not saying that love does not exist. Right? It's so beautiful when you do find that romantic chemistry that you have with somebody. But what I am saying is that for anybody to have any type of love, any type of happiness, any type of success, that love isn't something that you just grab or take or acquire. It's something that you create, something that starts internally and then manifests it outward. And so there's a quote that I read the other day uh, that said, if you change the way you look at things, the things you look at begin to change. And that to me is that clarity. And that's the love that I want to talk about. But it's unfair for me to continue talking about love without talking about its opposite. Many people think that the opposite of love is hate. But when we take hate and deconstruct hate to the core, we realize that it's fear. It's fear. Now what psychology tells us is this. Why people do the things that they do is because of two core principles. One, to avoid pain, or two, to gain pleasure. This could be easily translated to fear or love. Fear are insecurities. Fear are our discomforts. Fear are our delusional ceilings that we put on ourselves that limit us from our true potential. Right? Fear is hanging out with your buddies at the bar, and you see this chick who's really attractive, really cute, and you want to ask her out, but you don't. Because what if she rejects you? You know what? It's more comfortable hanging here with my boys. I won't do that. Fear is being complacent at a miserable job instead of applying to your dream job. Because what if they call you up and they say, you're not good enough? Or what if you decide to start your dream company and if it fails? What if you go bankrupt? You know what? I'll just stay here. Fear are insecurities. And we all have them. It's not just in some and not in others. It's in all of us, right? But it's how much power that we give fear that determines whether we live our fears and our life decisions based of fear or love. Because I have come to define love as a liberating passion. I'll explain this definition in a story, my story. You see, my passion has always been to bring people together. I've always been interested on how a story, how a poem, how music, how a movie this is the same emotions from people on opposite ends of the world, right? That it didn't matter if you were black, white, Christian, Muslim, Jewish. We all feel. We all know what it's like to be loved, to be accepted, to be brought in and cheered. 
The same way we all know what it feels like to be rejected, to lose, to cry, to be angry. And that, to me, that universal emotion is what connects us all. So my passion has always been to use my gift of storytelling and spoken word to remind people of this oneness. So my story starts at the end of 2014. I was working a desk job at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. It was an okay desk job because I was surrounded by some of the intellectuals who started the information era. But it just wasn't me. I remember going in every single day, and I wanted to do something more. I wanted to use my passion to do something big. I didn't know what it was, but I wanted to inspire people, to motivate people. But this desk, it was sort of stopping me. So some days I would go in and I would strategize and create this plan that A would lead to B and B would lead to C, and it was a genius plan. And then the next day I would come and see the same sheet of paper, and I was like, well, this is a stupid fantasy. And so for three to four months, I was in this limbo. But no matter how many times I tried to ignore it, tried to reject it, I would always find myself in this fork in the road between fear and love. So on January 1st, 2015, I mustered up the courage to jump into love. My business partner and I created Universe Creative Agency. It was an agency to bring in artists to use their art to create a world we can all coexist. In the first month, we got accepted to 1789 Venture Lab, which is a small incubator at UNC Entrepreneurship Department. UNC was ranked by Forbes Magazine as the number one entrepreneurship campus. We were there. By the second month, we had recruited three of the top artists in the country, artists who had performed on CNN, Univision, TEDx, had performed at the Pentagon, uh, the White House. We had those artists. And by month three, we got a grant by UNC to go to Portobello, Panama to celebrate the Congo's y Diablos tradition. We drank, we had fun, but we also did what we love to do, which was create art. We came back to UNC to do a two-day special. We sold out both days. We were featured on local and regional newspaper, and our project got picked up by NPR and PRI, reaching more than 1.5 million people worldwide. We were on fire. Everything we did felt so good. Three months ago, I was sitting at the desk job, and finally, three months later, I had created my idea to something tangible, something real. I was on top of the world, and nothing, nothing could stop me until it did. March 2015 was by far one of the best months of my life. April 2015 was by far one of the worst months of my life. Unfortunately, a lot of personal emergencies came up on my business partner's side, and he had to step away from the company. This left me with double the work and on a very lonely road. To cope with the stress, I would play soccer. That's usually what I did. But little did I know that playing soccer, I would tear my MCL, spend a day at the, at the hospital. I was an, an entrepreneur with no insurance. I was $10,000 in debt. I was both financially and physically crippled. And as if things couldn't get any worse, the following week I get a phone call from my mother. She's in tears. She says, mijo, I say, yeah, mom. She says, your father has been diagnosed with cancer. In two weeks, in two weeks, I went from feeling like I had the world at the palm of my hand to being crushed by the weight of the world on my shoulders, feeling like I was on top of the world, like I could do anything, to crashing down and crashing down hard. Now, I don't know many folks in here, but I do know that at some point, if you haven't experienced already, all your fears will be manifested to the nth degree. And it is so easy at that point to go back to your comfort zone. To look yourself in the mirror and say, you know what? You're not good enough. This was always a stupid fantasy. You see, I told you I was right. And I did that. I did that for the first two days. But I realized something, even at my lowest point. I realized that I once thought that if all my fears were manifested, that some way or somehow I would die. But I was still alive. I was still breathing. I still had a fighting chance. And again, I found myself at the fork in the road between fear and love. And I chose love. And so I got back to it. 
I strategized and strategized and tried to come up with the best plan. I crumbled paper, strategized and strategized until I came up with the best plan I possibly could. My company we were put on hold. I called my clients and artists and told them the situation. They were very honest and supportive of me. Secondly, my finances. I applied to every financial assistant out there, even the grants. I was this close to sending a letter to Barack Obama and said, help a brother out. <laughs> and three, and more importantly, I decided to close up shop in Chapel Hill and move down to Charlotte to start the process of healing. And almost like a movie, I got a phone call on my way down. And it's, it was a director from a CMS school here. And he says, Harrison, I saw you perform at TEDx Charlotte and I really love what you do. I would love you to be the keynote speaker for our graduation. I said, this is perfect. I need the money and I got a lot to say. And so fast forward to the event. I remember I finished performing and I was getting off stage. I remember looking at the stage as if it had some type of aura, some pulse. And I remember feeling for the first time in a very long time, I felt cleansed. Like I had taken all this negative energy and transformed it into something inspirational, something powerful. And now the crowd was on their feet giving me a standing ovation. It felt good. I took pictures with the graduates, shook hands with the parents, and after a while, this guy in a, in a tailored suit comes up to me. He says, man, that was amazing. I said, thank you, sir. He said, have you heard about the Million Dollar Roundtable, son? I said, no, sir, I haven't. He said, the Million Dollar Roundtable is an exclusive conference where only the top financial advisors go. And I'm the vice president of a financial firm here, and since I've been a financial advisor, I've always gone, and I got to say, kid, your speech today is ranked up there with the international speakers in that conference. I said, thank you, sir. He said, I got 30 minutes. How about you tell me a little bit about this spoken word? I said, all right. So we sat there. I told him about storytelling. I told him about how words can take an emotion from zero to 100 or from 100 to zero. How can you make people more engaged and feel good about themselves and empower them to increase their performance? After a while, he looked at his watch. 30 minutes had become an hour. He says, whew, I'm late. He said, chicas, I like where your head is at. How about you swing by the office, propose a program or something, and see if we can collaborate? I think my company could use this. I said, yes, sir, I'd be glad to. I went home and I got right to work. I started strategizing, coming up with the best program ever. When I get another phone call, this one, not as great. He said, is this Mr. Chicas? I said, yes, it is. He said, this is collections calling from UNC Healthcare. I was like, oh, you found me. <laughs> he said, Mr. Chicas, I don't know if you know this, but you have an outstanding balance of over $5,000 in your new balance. I was like, well, how much do I owe in my old balance, knowing I owe about three to $4,000? He said, zero. I said, zero? He said, yeah, zero. And I was like, two things could have happened. Either somebody in the back screwed up and it was benefiting me, or my financial system went through, and if that was the case, then I didn't owe anything from this new balance. So I looked up to this guy and I said, sir, I think my financial assistant went through, and if that's the case, I don't owe anything in this new balance either. And he said, Mr. Chicas, I'm going to go ahead and call the committee, and I'll call you back in 10 minutes. Does that sound good? I said, that sounds great. Hangs up. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever been to a Latino household, but Latinos are pretty Catholic, and my mother's no different. She has like a candle for every saint out there. <laughs> Now, I'm not an average churchgoer, but that day I was like, woohoo! I brought out all the roses. I started praying in every language. I only know two, but I was like, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I hear the phone ring. I pick it up. He says, Mr. Chicas. I said, yes, this is me. He said, Mr. Chicas, I talked to the committee, and it turns out you're debt free. I hang the phone up. The next week, I'm looking at my reflection on this golden metallic elevator that's going up. It's in Valentine. I'm going up to the vice president's office, and I'm thinking to myself, what a metaphor. What a metaphor of getting out of this hole. 
Two weeks ago, I was $10,000 in debt. All my fears manifested. I felt like I was going to die. And check me out now. Is this a dream? Is God messing with me? And as I went up, I got to the guy's office. I shook his hand. He introduced me to his whole department. He brings me to his office, which has a freaking golf course in the backyard. He sits me down and he says, what you got for me, chicas? For the next hour and a half, I present to him. I present everything that I had from psychology, positive psychology, to executive coaching, to emotional intelligence, to how you can create emotions and create a profit off of it. Towards the end... I was ready for the objections. I had been practicing all morning. He was going to say, it's too much, it's too long, we can't do it right now. So I was ready. So I looked him in the eye and I said, any questions? He says, chicas, I got one question. I was like, bring it on. He said, chicas, where do I sign? I said, right here. You sign right here. <laughs> he signs. We shake hands. I go downstairs. I go into my car, and I'm there for 15 minutes like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. This just, this just happened. This just, I just did this. Fast forward to November. We finished the program. AXA Advisors, South Charlotte was the best branch in their company on the Southeast region. Peter Sinek broke three uh, national records for his company, and I was so happy to be a part of that as well. Fast forward to December. The doctor comes out of the surgery room where my father had gone in for his, his surgery for cancer. The doctor looks me and my brother in the eye and says, I got two things for you. So the first thing is make sure you guys get tested at, as soon as you turn 40. And the second thing is that we ran some tests on your dad and he seems healthy. And he's cancer free just in time for Christmas. In one year, in one year, an average 23-year-old decided to, to jump into love. Decided to jump into love, and in that one year, his whole life changed. Went from being the top of the top to having it all, to all his fears manifested, to getting it all back again. And with the momentum of that year, I also got, this year, I also got invited by an international photographer, Saul Flores to accompany him on his project called Skin of the Natives, which we presented here at the Mint Museum. I also got invited to Yale University to speak with Dr. Mark Brackett, who's the leading researcher in emotional intelligence. I got accepted to NACA, and funny story, two weeks ago, this agent called me up, said, chicas, uh, I just sent in a proposal to a big conference. I hope you're not mad at me. I was like, no, I'm not mad at her. That's what I do. She said, I said, so I said, what's the conference? She said, it's the million-dollar roundtable. <laughs> now, I don't know if I'll get that proposal. I don't know where I'll be next year. And I don't tell you my story to boast or to be the monkey that said, oh, no, I'll save you. Don't drown, as he picked up the fish and put them on the train. I don't know your story. I don't know what your passion is. But I do know one thing, that just like me, you got to do a lot of life decisions. You got little small decisions throughout your day. And if anything, I hope my story encourages you to go ahead and choose love, despite how hard it may be. Because even when, when my fears manifested, even at my lowest point, I realized how unbreakable I still was and how powerful the human spirit still is and how powerful love can propel you. And so I hope you leave here knowing that Love is created. It is something that you decide to create and jump towards, and it liberates you from all your fears despite how big you think those fears may be. And so I end this presentation with a poem that I wrote when I decided to quit my job in 2014, and it's called Five Things to Do Sometime in Life. Five things to do sometime in life. One, follow your heart. There is no need for a Twitter feed for you to follow your heart. So feel the passion in your pulse and push the possibilities. You see, the worst regret a dying man can have 
is realizing that he's lived his life all wrong. But your hourglass is still young. So why are you making what-if stories like a terminal illness? Why do you infect your, your tongue with mediocrity? Who scared the God in you and told you you were just human? I dare you to stare in the mirror and then tell me if all Spartans are extinct too. When you find what you are looking for, hold on to it. Hold on to it like the last hug from a wife before a husband goes off to Iraq. Like the night holds the moon right before the morning. Hold on to it like they would need crowbars, police dogs, fire hoses, and a 1960s cafe diner to try to take it from you, and they still won't. When you find what you are looking for, practice it until you master it. Master it until you become it. Become it until you don't know where it begins and you end. It begins and ends with you. Remember, 10,000 hours to make your dream come true will always be better than spending an eternity making someone else's. Three, conquer your fear. Three, conquer your doubts. Three, Conquer your doubts. Don't let fear scare your faith and take your fate away. People from all corners of the world will always have something to say, whether good or bad. Always say thank you and put their two cents in a jar that reads, it doesn't matter what matters are your manners. Mind over matter, matter of fact, their minds aren't big enough to fathom your ladder, but you, you gotta believe that this, whatever it may be, will lead to something more than just the piggy bank of opinions. This will be the thing that everybody wanted to do, but didn't have the balls or ovaries to do it. This is blood, sweat, and tears manifested into a trophy, a pat on the back, or a sold out concert, but before. Establish your work ethic. The callous hands and the dark eye sockets are only temporary, and you are not working for temporary. Set a goal and remind yourself every single day that you will die on this treadmill before you let that guy beat you in a race. And then when you realize you are still alive and winning, celebrate. Celebrate every big victory and reflect on every small loss. Be grateful for every step forward, even if that means taking a step back to see the bigger picture. The answer to how good you are at it will ultimately stem from the answer to how bad do you want it. Five. Repeat steps one through four <laughs> over and over and over and over again. Because winning the war means winning the battles. And you already knew even before the mirror told you that Spartans still exist. Thank you. <laughs>